Kia ora, Aotearoa. Good evening and welcome to the Union Report where we review the news week through the lens of industrial disputes with union leaders, commentators and politicians. Joining me tonight to discuss events is Rachel McIntosh, Director of Organising at the EPMU and the National Secretary of the NZEI, Paul Golter. Welcome to you both. Coming up tonight, issue one, the EPMU call it a job crisis. Government calls it a challenge. What are the solutions? Issue two, national standards are flawed and information used to judge school closures in Christchurch was wrong. Is public education under attack? Issue three, if youth wages are the answer, what was the question? Plus, we'll wrap with a final thought, but let's start the show with issue one. The EPMU hosted a jobs in manufacturing crisis meeting last week with academics, manufacturers and unions and politicians all coming together to discuss the collapse of jobs within the manufacturing sector. Rachel Peter Conway from the CTU described the situation as a crisis. The government simply called it a challenge. Is there a crisis in manufacturing? There is a crisis in manufacturing. When John Key came to power, the unemployment rate in this country was 5%, and he called a jobs That's summit. Right. That's right. Uh, he didn't change any policies, and no new jobs were created. So it, now employment is 6.8%. If there was a crisis then, there's certainly a crisis now. Mm. 40,000 nearly manufacturing jobs disappeared in the mm. last four years. And yes, there definitely is a crisis. That's why we called the summit. Why are those jobs more important than other people's jobs? Why is it the manufacturing specifically is so important to the New Zealand economy? Manufacturing is important because manufacturing jobs tend to be high skilled and high return jobs. And in fact, the way the economy works for every manufacturing job, there are up to two other jobs in the economy. So right. if you get rid of the manufacturing jobs, the servicing jobs will disappear as sure, well. Sure, sure. Um, we're seeing a lot of people going overseas. Is that where our manufacturing skill base is leaving now? It is, yeah. I mean, there's now a trades drain. A few years ago, there was a professional drain. There's now a trades drain. So trades people are losing their jobs in this country and mm. they're going to Australia mostly. So they're leaving the country. If we don't have a manufacturing base in our economy, how do we actually get to a high growth, uh, productive country? Well, we, we don't want to contemplate that. That's why we're fighting now to keep yeah. manufacturing and to resurrect manufacturing and to have it growing. Because if you don't have a manufacturing base, then you don't have a first world economy. So why doesn't the government see that? I mean, it seems so astoundingly obvious to everybody else in the game. I mean, I'd hate to answer for John Key, but it seems that they have an ideology, which is uh, laissez-faire. And so they're laissez-faring it um, for all they're worth. Paul, we have held on to neoliberal uh, monetary policy for three decades. Is it time? For New Zealand to reevaluate some of the sacred free market cows, and if it isn't working for the economy, should we be implementing the same dogma into education? Well, firstly, you're right about the economy. Um, we've had this rubbish really since the um, Labor government in the 1980s. Mm. It hasn't worked here. It hasn't worked overseas. Uh, we've got the global financial crisis to thank for that. Uh, it's probably a good idea that we stop thinking that's the answer and do something else. Mm. In education. Uh, it, it's just as bad. We've had neoliberal ideas um, dragged into the sector, principally from the states. Uh, they haven't worked there. The American education system is an absolute mess. Everyone knows that. And suddenly we seem to have a government here that looks to America and other failed education systems like the like England and say, here, here's the great answer. It, it, it hasn't worked there. Why in God's name would we want to do it here? Were you impressed with any of the answers you heard from the people they brought over trying to sell the charter school idea in New Zealand? I mean, they, they, had, they had a couple of people. I listened to them. They didn't seem to have any of the answers, though. It's in interesting, the charter school space, because uh, it was sold by banks. And remember, it came in in the most That's discredited right. way, yeah. and then no yeah. political mandate at all, with the most discredited politician in New Zealand pushing yeah. it. In it comes. They jack up a, a committee uh, which says, um, let's do a particular New Zealand version of it. We said to that uh, committee, Catherine Isaac's committee, why? Mm. The question here about charter schools is why? Show us the evidence that charter schools have lifted any education system's performance across the world, yeah. and maybe we can get into a conversation, but show us the evidence. Not one person, including the Americans they brought out a couple of weeks ago, and has been able to show us that. What, in fact, they default to is saying, well, why don't we just give it a go, Paul? Why does an NZDI just give it a go? We're never going to give a go uh, in that way to something that's going to damage children's learning 
and ruin our quality public education system. We have one of the highest uh, well-ranked uh, public education systems in the world. Do you feel that teachers are being listened to when these ideas are being implemented? I mean, you guys are at the coalface. You've got the best ideas about how we make it work. Are you being listened to? No, we're not. And this, it has been shown overseas and here, successful education change comes when the sector works with the policy mm, makers mm, hand mm. in glove. Uh, it didn't happen under Anne Tolley's leadership uh, in, in the Ministry of as Minister of Education, and it's certainly not happening now. All sorts of um, groups are being set up to, to, to consult with the sector. Mm. No one's got any faith in them. No one's got any trust in them. Rachel, how damaging is the high dollar for our exporters? I mean, we heard from several uh, manufacturers that it's absolutely killing their business model. Yeah. Well, we've had in the EPMU this year 75 different businesses have had redundancies, some of them total closures. Sure. And the absolute bottom line across the board common factor is the high dollar. Uh, we heard from Selwyn Pellet last week who said that his profit margins have halved. His mm. business is just as efficient. He's doing nothing differently. But with the dollar going to 80%, uh, his profit is just disappearing. If it goes to a dollar, he was saying that the chances of, of, of manufacturing in this, in this country are over. Yeah, he did say that. And yeah, I mean, I think that that's the case. It, the higher the dollar gets, the harder it is to get wage increases in manufacturing, and then the next thing that happens after that is that people start to lose their jobs. Now, the government will say, well, that's just your fault because you're not trimming the fat fast enough. Is there any more fat to trim in manufacturing? There isn't. Manufacturing, they've been talking about lean manufacturing for years. In fact, what they've been doing is stripping costs out of their businesses as fast and as hard as they can. Mm. Uh, where we're strong, they do that in consultation with us and in sensible ways. Yeah, yeah. Where yep. we're not strong, they do it often to the detriment of the workers. There is, there's, there's nowhere more for that to go. You know, it has to be a political solution now. Does it suggest that things have gotten so serious that the unions and the manufacturers themselves are sitting down and wanting to come up with solutions? I mean, normally the two of you are at loggerheads. This, over this issue, you seem to be completely singing from same song sheet. That's right, which is an interesting position to be yeah, in. Yeah. When there is a crisis, you do need to form coalitions. You need to think outside the square. We can't just be in the traditional rut of you know, oppositional behaviour. Mm. So we're talking to people who do see things the same way that we do on this issue. Paul, one of the uh, participants at the meeting said if we wanted a flat screen TV economy, we would end up with a flat line economy. But the flip side is that a lower dollar will rise costs for the poorest people. How do we balance that? Well, I mean, the point I think uh, Rachel's saying is absolutely right. This is a very, very complicated problem. Mm, mm. And what we get with this government is this notion, well, look, if we just leave it to the market, it's going to sort it. Mm. And clearly that has failed. This needs the sort of conversations the um, EPMU has been having with manufacturers. It needs that sort of conversation happening across the rest of the economy. Yeah, yeah. So all of the participants are brought in, into it, and we do develop that New Zealand response. Yeah. Instead, what we're just told is back, the government's backing out of this. We're not going to pick winners. You know, We've heard it all before. And somehow or another, this uh, great e economic miracle is going to drop out of the sky. Well, hang on, we're still waiting for it. Do we need an active government or do we need small government? We, we need an active government. We've had small government. The, uh, the uh, Labor government in the 1980s and in particularly the Bolger Ruth Richardson government wound mm. government back to levels that the economy could no longer sustain. Mm. Uh, the Clark-led governments started to build that back up, uh, certainly not up to the levels that we, we think are necessary. Small economy like New Zealand, you can't take government out of it. Mm. That's just um, ideological dogma. It's failed. We keep coming back. This stuff has failed. Why, are we, why is John Key and Bill English continuing to dish it up to New Zealanders? Mm. Mm. Very good point. Uh, both of you, final question on this one. A lot of talk about a financial transaction tax, which at 0.5% would generate $15 billion in tax revenue each year. Is it time, do you think, for New Zealand to start considering something as radical and dynamic as that? I think we need to consider all the possible solutions. So if you're, this, we're in a crisis, so you need to look at a lot of solutions. Some of them might seem really radical. Mm -hmm. We need to evaluate each one, mm. and we need to talk to academics, and we need to talk to business people. That's mm. why we have been um, part of this debate. We're not saying we know the answer, sure, but we, sure. we think that everything needs to be considered. Shouldn't the corporations who are helpful in creating the 2007 crash, shouldn't they help in actually rebuilding some of that capital back into our economy with something like a financial transaction tax? 
Uh, yes, well, that, this takes me back to <laughs> <laughs> arguments I've had over many years. Yep. Uh, look, uh, clearly the banks, the big banks, um, failed the global economy. Mm. There's no, no doubt about that. Mm. Credit agencies failed the global economy. Regulators failed the global economy. Who's wearing, wearing that? Ordinary working folk, the sort of people that uh, Rachel's been talking about mm. in, in manufacturing and in the service, service sector. And you know what? Those same people who failed the global economy then are now telling everyone what's good for them. Mm. And this is, this is what's remarkable about, um, about what's happened over the past couple of years. Now, arguably, in that vacuum after the global financial crisis, the left should have moved into that space with its own program and driven that hard. Now, mm. in fact, that retrospect says that didn't happen and the right captured that space again with the same old prescriptions, the same old faces, and said this is what we have to do. The, the financial transactions tax, the Tobin tax, is an excellent example. That tax is now being widely talked about in a number of um, global institutions mm, mm. as an appropriate way to manage uh, global uh, financial flows. Mm. It's no longer the so-called, as I've heard it called, the wacky fringe of, That's right. of, mm. of taxation or government policy. It's now front and centre with lots of people and institutions pushing it. Our government here go, oh, wow, well, well, that, that's really wacky. We can't go anywhere near that. Well, they've got to become mainstream. We're increasingly being isolated yeah. with the sort of dogmatic approach. Um, and and this country is saying that's enough. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you, panel. Moving on with issue two. National standards are flawed and information used to judge school closures in Christchurch was wrong. Paul, is Hekia Parata failing as education minister? Well, I th uh, rather than t target a, a particular minister, I think the, this government's policies are failing. Mm. Um, whether or not uh, Heka Parata is selling them properly or is, is another issue which really is sec a second order issue to the main issue. This government's policies in education are failing. They are, are set to destroy what is a very, very highly successful education system full of people who want to make it better. Mm. It, it teachers, support staffs, principals, early child, primary and secondary, we all want to make it better. And yet this government is actually saying, and it's dog whistling this, that teachers are the problem. Yes, and, yes. And, and the teachers know that's not the case. We won't accept, accept that, but more importantly, the public and the community and parents know that that's not the case. And just as uh, the government uh, made a complete mess of the class size mm. uh, issue, they are now making a complete mess of Christchurch. Their data is flawed. More importantly, they've got the processes in Christchurch wrong. Instead of engaging the whole community in consultation about what education across the sector should look like, joining up uh, vertically early childhood, primary, secondary, tertiary, mm -hmm. and then across service providers like health and um, social welfare, etc. Yeah. They didn't take that conversation to the people, to schools and to early childhood centres. They just put them into little clusters and said, sort yourselves out. Well, common sense says you can't sort yourself self out if you haven't got the broader context. Sure, sure, sure. Th thank you for that. Is, is the largest issue facing Māori and Pacific Island students really that their teachers can't pronounce their names? Uh, that's that's such a trivial um, comment by the minister, and unfortunately, uh, it takes attention away oh. from the fact that the the education system as a whole needs to continue to work together to lift uh, Maori and Pacific Island achievement. The thing about that space is that teachers and principals know who these uh, children are; mm -hmm. they know what's needed needs to be done. We don't need um, Wellington telling schools around and early childhood centres around the country what they need to do. Yeah. Rachel, <clears throat> what faith can teachers have in the Ministry of Education when the information they are using to close schools is completely wrong? Well, I don't think teachers can have faith. And I think what's happening is that the government has got used to being the one who drives the discourse. Right. And that everybody just believes their story. So they've got away for the last four years without having to do their homework. Mm. And finally now we're starting to see they're making a lot of mistakes which are actually coming to light. Mm. You, can't, you can only do improper consultation when you're running the story. And what we're seeing now is a turnaround that the government is not able to run that story any longer. Uh, so that puts pressure on them to consult properly. Does it make the 
consultation a pretense? I mean, everyone seems to think that they're just, they've already made their mind up. Yeah, if they've made their mind up and they haven't done the research and they're hell-bent on the solution that they've come up with, then mm. yes, consultation is just uh, lip service. Does that, does that distrust the interest, just go across the entire sector? I mean, if they're making decisions based on false information because they've got a goal in mind anyway, then how can you trust anything else they do in the next two years? I mean, that's the whole... That's the whole story yeah, of yeah. the government that is running an agenda that is based on ideology and is not based on research and is not based on conversation, is no. not based on proper engagement. Which is weird, isn't it, that we're deciding to implement um, <laughs> ideas without any empirical evidence. It's just rhetoric. Um, Paul, newspapers don't care about your kids' educational achievement. They care about selling newspapers. Has the media, do you think, been irresponsible attempting to use data as faulty as the national standards to draw any conclusions? Well, we do, and, and commentators other than NZDI uh, have pointed that out. Mm. But I, I, I think the trick here is, is not so much the media. Um, one has to ask, are the media in fact doing the government's bidding? Yes. And yes. this government uh, uh, told us when Anne Tolley was minister that they didn't want league tables. That's right. We had also been told by the current administration they didn't want league tables. Then we were told, well, let, let's do league tables before the media do league tables. And, and so it goes on. Hmm. Our, our members, uh, teachers and support staff, knew this was going to happen. Lots of parents know it's going to happen and, and they have rejected it. So the question you'd have to ask about the media is why were the media compliant with the government's overall agenda? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in America, uh, they print all of the teachers and photos of the teachers in their newspapers when they do their league rankings. Would we see something as ridiculous as that here? Well, that, that, and those are dreadful stories from America mm. um, resulting in, in all sorts of casualties amongst the teachers. And the Minister of, uh, of Education was in New York when the New York Post uh, earlier this year uh, did exactly that. And she mm. came back and made very clear statements, uh, to her credit, that, that she didn't want any of that to occur here. Right. Well, hello, what's, what in fact is starting to be developed with this? And then you put the narrative from the government around performance-based pay in beside it. Mm. You've got the blame and sh name, shame and blame mm. uh, culture coming into teaching. We all know that successful learning is built on collaboration and sharing, not competition. This government is so fixated on competition that somehow it's going to cause a miracle in already one of the highest performing education systems in the world. Is that a valid point that we seem to have a government very, very focused on creating false competition models within the economy that don't actually end up benefiting the country? That's right. When, when your training is just in the commercial sphere, when you're a, an international banker and a currency trader, mm. if that's your only trade, training, then you, if that's what you try and apply to education and other systems where the competitive model simply isn't relevant, mm. then you will get these kind of botched outcomes. Yeah. What do we need to do within uh, manufacturing that will be able to provoke um, uh, competition but actually keep it within some type of uh, realm where we can see the benefits, not just going to profits? Well, in, in manufacturing, well, in the whole of the economy, we need strong union rights so mm. that workers can bargain. Yeah. International research shows that high-wage economies are economies with coordinated collective bargaining across the across the across industry so we need that we need a good skills strategy so that people are being being trained that managers are being trained in order to know how to apply the skills that people are gaining mm -hmm. and that that's tied to wages through collective bargaining that's how you build a good strong manufacturing economy final question to both of you uh, even with mass job losses education sector attacks and the dot-com fiasco the government are still in the tv3 poll riding high at 48.8%, 1.5% above what they gained on election night. When does this start turning for the government? Oh, I, I think it has started to turn. Um, th this government is certainly, the trend has trended down, mm. uh, and that continued throughout the election. So I'm, I'm confident that that's happening. The question is when, you mm. know, it, it, rather than if. It, it is happening. Will it happen in time for the next election is, is really the question on everyone's mind. Do you think voters are, are able to look at the problems and connect it to the government? I mean, is there still some level of, well, it's not John Key's fault, the, 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 the global financial crisis is here, so we're not going to blame him too much. I mean, at what point do you start attaching the policies to this government? Well, well I think, I think you've, um, you've hit the nail on the head um, that John Key's been a Teflon 
as far as these these issues are concerned, and he's been able to um, dish them off um, and then sort of back, handle the backstory mm. uh, with them and and shift accordingly, shift blame away from him. But I, th I think the noose is tightening here. Mm. You know that that whole mess inside Christchurch, particularly with the schools. Mm. Um, you've got the outfall from Pike River. Uh, you've got the economy, the jobless rates, all the great promises. You know, I mean, come on, John. Where is the, the gap with mm. uh, Australia? Is it closed mm. under your leadership? Absolutely not. So John, John Key is proving very disappointing in his ability to deliver uh, the sort of economy that, that he promised. And Kiwis are waking up to that. You think education is the tripping point here? Because when you talk about the economy, it's a little bit sort of disconnected from you. But if you've got kids at school, this stuff matters, doesn't it? Yeah, and that story in Christchurch, that was clear and that was stark. And there were no, no two ways of looking yeah. at it. You could yeah. not come out and say, this is not a crisis. You couldn't come out and say, we didn't get this wrong. So yeah. uh, that may be the tipping point. Uh, Hiki Aparada, you might, might get reshuffled out of, out of education. Any thoughts? No. No? Worry. She'll stay? You think she might get reshuffled? Um, I... I think that would be a big move for the um, for the national government. Well, you can live in hope. <laughs> Thank you, panel. Moving on with issue three. The latest solution to our youth unemployment stats is apparently paying them 20% below the minimum wage for six months. Rachel, don't employers have enough powers with the 90-day right to sack law to try workers and give them a chance, and if they don't work out, they can dump them? Why do they need this, this, this new youth rate? Well, the argument is that it'll get people into work. The 90-day um, trial doesn't, hasn't made a difference. in no, Unemployment's no. been going up. The argument for lower wages to get people into work who wouldn't otherwise be in work is the same argument that was used to keep women's pay lower than men's pay until You're the Equal Pay Act right. of 1972. Yes. And the possible next... You know where you go from that as well. So, do we have a lower rate for Māori workers, and do we have a yeah, lower yeah. rate for Pacific workers because they find it hard to find work as well? Uh, that's clearly discriminatory. I don't know how they can get away with it with youth. Uh, Paul, people find living on the minimum wage difficult enough as it is. How are 16 to 19 year olds supposed to live on 20% less than the minimum wage for six months, especially when many won't be working 40 hours a week and they'll be part time? Well. The government know the answer to that. You just shift the burden back on the parents, right? Back into the households, right. and uh, it so it doesn't go away. That problem, you just shift it into a space where the government can say it's not a, not our problem any right. longer. It, the, the policy is an a, absolute insult. I agree with what Rachel was saying here. That this sort of mumbo jumbo about um, slashing the what the incomes of the most defenceless in the economy, mm. who, are, who are these new starters, then if you have, have youth who are Māori or Pacific Island, you've got that multiplier effect kicking in here, and somehow or another a sort of Mitt Romney-esque type response is, um, let's cut their wages further, because that might just get that mm. over the line. Yeah. It's rubbish. It doesn't work overseas. Even one of the weekend newspapers in their editorial questioned it strongly and said, National, you're on notice about this stuff. Mm. You've got to produce the evidence that this is going to lift here. I think the economy is starting to wake up. Right-wing blogger David Farrar went as far to suggest that it should be for any beneficiary, the 20% lower, coming back into the workforce to help beneficiaries get into the workforce. Uh, that would be even worse, <laughs> wouldn't it, for the, uh, the, the, than just leaving to you? Well, it's breathtaking, really, that, that sort of assumption and the, the complete lack of evidence that sits behind, behind any of this. this um, in fact, we should be putting more into that group mm. because they are our, are our future, not slashing them. And that's why, as Rachel says, they're all heading off to Australia. Well, why wouldn't you? If I question to both of you. If you don't take up a job for $10.80 per hour, you'll get your benefit cut. How does that help lift beneficiaries out of poverty. It's a curious alternative to a job strategy, isn't it? To um, have low wages and to cut pay and to cut benefits. It, it doesn't, the jobs aren't there. That's why people are unable to work. And flies completely in the face of the living wage movement that the CTU is currently promoting, Absolutely, right? yes. Yeah. So there's a living wage campaign and there's what we were talking about before about coordinated collective bargaining to lift wages and to contribute to a skill strategy. How does $10.80 an hour lift you out of wage? Uh, lift, sorry, lift you out of, out of poverty. Maybe you could ask John Key. I s suspect it's a long time since he was on $10.80 an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that, that's the answer. The, the, the arrogance of this government is breathtaking when it comes to the, these things. This stuff's been tried before. Mm. The, um, the Clark-led government 
fix that mm. in the early 2000s, and they're recycling. Talk about retreads. I mean, you've got Bill English. It's no surprise. Yeah. Uh, question to uh, both of you finally on this. Treasury originally wanted a rate at $9.60 an hour. Does that show how to, out of touch some within government are with the reality of poverty in New Zealand? Nine dollars sixty an hour. Yeah, well, I think it shows that um, whoever came up with that has never tried to live on that wage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it also it's reminiscent of the benefit cuts of the early nineties, which yeah. you know precipitated a recession and increased poverty and started that real um, increase in inequality that this country has been seeing. Yeah, yeah. It has been getting worse since this government came to power. With our inequality rates at the highest that they've ever been in our history, does nine dollars sixty an hour go anywhere in sorting that out? bomber that's probably the same brain that thought up the bigger class sizes mm, mm, absolutely thank you panel let's wrap the show with a final word uh, rachel your final word this week is um, sure what we want to see is policy for jobs we want to see a policy reaction to the jobs crisis that mm. involves tax policy that involves bringing the dollar down uh, we also want to see a proper skill strategy and strong collective bargaining in this country excellent thank you uh, paul your final word this week well, New Zealand's got a, a great and wonderful quality public education system. Uh, parents and communities uh, everywhere in New Zealand know this, and yet uh, this government seems hell-bent on destroying it. It's introduced untrialled, untested, dodgy national standards, or ROPI, um, John Key called them. Mm -hmm. It's introduced le league tables. It's playing around with John Banks' idea of charter schools and, and we'll probably see legislation the next week or so around that. It's trying to say performance-based pay is a good idea in schools, competition with children being used as the units mm. in, in that model. You've got um, a, a relook at school governance going on, the early childhood funding cuts. Every parent who's got children coming into early childhood or in early childhood education know that what that's about and yet somehow they're saying we've got the answers. Well, what we're saying is just leave that system alone. We'll work together and make it even better. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Rachel. That's it for the show. Check out our Facebook site for ongoing union campaigns and actions and follow me on my Citizen Bomber Twitter account for all the latest show updates. Thanks for watching RTO. Join us again 8pm next Monday for the final union report, which just happens to be Labor Day, here on Triangle TV, the home of original public broadcasting. Good night, New Zealand.